Welcome to The Lumber Word, where industry veterans Matt Beamer, Greg Riley, and Ashley Buckold dissect the world of commodity lumber each week. We bring you up-to-date insights on supply, demand, and market trends, sharing our trading expertise to benefit everyone in the supply chain. Join us for informative and entertaining discussions that guarantee to make you wiser about all things lumber. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Lumber Word, being recorded on Wednesday, April 3rd, the week before we all go up to Montreal for the Montreal Wood Convention. Greg is back in town this week. Matt, you're uh, you're back from vacation. How was your vacation? Uh, it was really nice. I went skiing. as cold. I went up in the mountains and skied with the kids and had had my last little blast of winter. It's It snowed every morning that I was there, and there was... Lots of fresh snow on the mountain. I I really liked it. Yeah, we're having we're having we're having the winter here in Chicago too. We got snow today. Nothing says April in Chicago like you know. Nothing says opening day baseball in Chicago like snow. I'm looking out the window right now, and it is it. Yeah, you're right, Greg. It's I've been to opening days at Wrigley like this with snow and rain. Yeah, no, that's a, that's basically what it is. Yeah, that was back still when Harry Carey was there, and you could get a, an old style for probably a buck fifty. <laughs> So look at it. We have a great guest today, uh, Russ Taylor from Russ Taylor Global. We're excited to have him for a lot of reasons. Not only is he a great guy, but he brings actual real information that Greg and I and Matt sometimes throw around. And I think we get pretty close sometimes, at least directionally. But Russ, Russ really has the chart. I wanted to also let Russ talk a little bit about what he has upcoming this year in Vancouver that everybody should know about, sign up about. A couple new items. I've, I'm on your email list now, Russ. What what should people know about what you've got working? Yeah, well, well, thanks to introduction, uh, Ashley, and good to be here again. And uh, I do a lot of consulting work, but uh, that's changed a little bit uh, this year. I've, I've I've done a multi client study on 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 China, looking out to, to 2020 2035. Really interesting. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But it's going to be a market again for uh, exporters, even with weak demand. And uh, also, we're doing a, a, a sort of international conference, uh, restarting my series that I had back under the Wood Markets banner from 2010 to 2019, talking about the trade, the Global Wood Summit will be held October 28th to 30th in Vancouver. So uh, it's going to be a really uh, sort of a good chance to, to talk the trade and talk what's happening with, with industry and markets. And I think even, Ashley, you and your, your, your group are going to think about doing a lumber word at that conference. We've yeah. talked about that further. Yeah, we are. Uh, and and look, at I've, I've been uh, to your events in Vancouver before. They're pretty well attended. I mean, who's like, what uh, What do you have so far for attendance? How many, what are you expecting? Uh, well, registration's not open yet. So yeah, it, okay, it'll be, okay. It'll be open later in May. But, uh, we, we, yeah, we, we typically get, uh, you know, about 225 to 275. So it's really people from the industry and the trade, and it's uh, no government speakers, no economists, no very a couple of specialized analysts, but it's really people from the industry and the trade, and and so the uh, networking sessions are really good, and people uh, always want more time for networking, so it's, it's always a good sign about a conference. <laughs> yeah, that's Matt. If we can get you, me, and Greg up there, we can do one or get part of us up there, and we can do it live from there. What's uh, what's the date on that, Russ? October twenty uh, eighth. Uh, through the 30th the conference stays for the 29th Vancouver? and the 30th you know yeah, uh, i'm available that day in the alternate right now i can drive up there oh very nice you can take a float <laughs> plane you can take a float plane up there it's yeah i i, I can be there for sure yeah okay. love, that sounds great to, actually i like i like Van- vancouver in the fall will be pretty also so what what do you guys think? You want to jump into talking about the market first or jumping into production? Greg and I had a pretty good call with some Euro people this week t- talking about production. Greg, what are your thoughts there? Um, you know, I think Russ should give us an overview of, you know, of, of his of his stuff and that'll that'll probably lead to uh insightful and probing questions which uh will titillate our uh, our listeners. Yeah. I mean, I agree because we did throw around a lot of conversation on where are we at in North America on production. We, Russ has the answer. Russ, Russ has the answer. Russ, I mean, we, we've, it's, so everybody listening to this, we've got our Russ pre- prepared a whole PowerPoint for this. So we'll talk to it and jump right into it. Where's that PowerPoint available to uh, listeners if they'd like to get it? Uh, they can contact me and I can I can send them a copy. 
uh, Russ Taylor at RussTaylorGlobal.com. Yeah, that's probably yeah, your email is probably going to blow up after this, Russ, and uh, you know you'll just be inundated with calls. So it sounds good. Worry. It sounds happy, good. Happy so to let, be of service. Yeah, let us, let us know where to start here, Russ. Um, well, you know, a really good place to start maybe is is is, is trying to keep it simple because I've got lots of data, and the data sometimes you get lost in the data. But if you go to uh, slide. Um, Four. Slide four, just kind of like, how did we do in 2023 versus 2022? And a lot of people don't really look at the annualized numbers that much, but production was down in 23 versus 2022. And, and so part of that is consumption was also down. You know, production was off 2.9% and, and consumption was off uh, a, a little bit by, by comparison, but, but I think it was roughly 2%. So what that means is that you know when you do have reduced uh, consumption, you're going to get you're going to show it up in reduced production, and then also you have the other balancing factors, the imports and the exports, and even the right. the offshore exports were lower. Some of the euro exports, even though they were higher throughout most of the year, they trickled much lower in in fourth quarter as prices dropped. Right, so they they retreated. So when I look at some of the, I mean, we always talk. We I know about BC a lot. I don't know how many people really follow BC, but you know BC production was down another. 12.6% in 23 versus 2022. And, you know, it's been dropping since 2017. I can talk about that in more detail, but, you know, we're, we're down, you know, we're down 10 billion board feet from, I think, 2005, from 17 to seven. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. you know, it, but it's a slow erosion over time. All the other major producing regions in North America were also lower in 2023 except for the California coast. I think it was up a couple of truckloads and the uh, north, the U.S. north was up a couple of truckloads. That's it. But, uh, you know, even the U.S. south with all the new mill capacity going in there, it was down like minus 0.2%. It didn't quite achieve what it achieved last year. And that's puzzling. And, you know, part of that's to do with, uh, you know, labor issues. Now, the markets were weak in fourth quarter. And, that caused some curtailments for the first time in a long time in the U.S. South. And even now, I mean, we've, we've got a crazy price spread. We can talk about this later between Southern Yellow Pine and SPF. These BC mills are now making more money than U.S. South mills at today's prices. That's incredible. That's, that hasn't happened in 15 so, years. Plus, are you saying that at today's current Western SPF prices that uh, BC mills are profitable? Just. Yeah, at, at four at four sixty ish, you know, uh, yeah, the the average mills finally making money. The the best better mills are making money, but uh, the, even the average mill, you know, again, the average mill, it's there's no such thing as an average mill, but depends how much of your logs are on the open market versus how much you're owned uh, through the government. So that that's a that's a dilemma. But yeah, in, in the U.S. South at, at at three at three, what is it, three fifty now? <laughs> You know, uh, at least the West, uh, U.S. Southwest, uh, that's uh, that's a skinny. They, they're not making money at those levels. Well, especially, you know, we had a conversation with one of the European mills today and the byproduct and the low grades. Right. As they as, as as that whole cutting profile, especially the low grade falls in price. That's that's a real issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it just spills through and, and your sales average just starts to drop as well when you can't move i mean the the number two grade is one thing but the low grades start to drop as well and pile up Russ, yeah. that brings up a really good point that a lot of people don't really pay attention to because most people don't dabble in low grade but when low grade prices are as depressed as they have been the last two years it really hurts a mill's bottom line it brings your sales average prices down a lot more than people realize that's a good piece of information. I'm interested in your chart here. There's one inf there's one little stat here that really kind of caught my eye and it's a, it's a shock to me. US inland production down almost 6% year over year. I find that shocking. That's actually one of the most profitable regions to produce lumber in. Why why do you suppose they're losing production when they're very profitable? Yes, I I don't know that answer, but I, I I know that for example there are some mills uh, curtailing right now with lack of fiber, and and then the prices are are they're saying are also a bit weak, but uh, but it sounds like it's fiber supply. So I don't know if the log prices squeeze them uh, out of the game. I don't want to name names, but what one I mill heard, announced. I know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I talked exactly. to one of my buddies that runs one of the inland mills over there and asked him about that, and and he said that there's just 
because it's been a, a warm and, and wetter winter spring that yep. they're getting their break up earlier. And then it's going to be, there's going to be log shortages in the inland this year that are abnormal. But the price, I'll take a look at print from yesterday, Russ. The price of two before number two hemp fur mill FOB Spokane is 560. I, Nobody's I, going broke at 560. Trust I was me. Say, I saw that. I went, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that, that's a dichotomy that doesn't really make much sense to me that they've got the most valuable output in the in the country it's the highest priced fiber you can buy and their log costs other than spring breakup generally competitive what with, with what we're paying out here in the west and sometimes cheaper you know i mean yeah. it's the, it's the dirty little secret of the inland region is that everybody thinks that their logs cost more than our logs no well, they don't no i i would agree i would agree usually they do a little better than the west coast on average, and and uh, and it's sort of a cons- constrained or contained unit where there's not a lot of competition. Let's call it. But now with the, you're right. Same in, in in BC, we've had a mild winter, and the the logging's uh, breakups earlier, and and it's the same thing where mills are going to be uh, probably curtailing. It may have to curtail in the in, in the spring if their log decks aren't filled up again. So right. yeah, log supply is a big issue. And then on the open market, logs that are available up in BC are way too expensive. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a, a dogfight to see who's going to operate and maybe who isn't. Russ, a, a two-part question. I mean, obviously, the, like I, I was blown away when I saw, you know, like what that decline has been. You know, we we know the BC production has fallen, but when you look at the number going from 17 billion board feet to less than seven, it's, it's really that's mind-boggling. What would your anticipation be on 2024 BC production? What's that going to be versus 23? It's going to be down. I mean, we've already had uh, three uh, mill closures <laughs> this year. So that's a, that's a sign. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole BC story is a combination of, I mean, the beetle is kind of past, basically. There's no real, uh, still some beetle wood around, but the, the, that's not really the issue. It's now it's all government, government policy, endless right. government policy current government caters to the urban voters and to get reelected, they don't care about the small towns and what's happening out there. So they're, they've done so many things with the old growth deferrals. If you've heard about, you know, that's a whole 7% mm-hmm. reduction, not just on the BC coast, but also in the interior, you know, protecting caribou, that's mighty, that's a federal government mandate, but going after, um, you know, caribou, there's all kinds of, uh, first, first nations initiatives. Uh, we were the, one of the first provinces to jump on, the First Nations um, uh, UNDRIP regulations, and which means the, the First Nations get access to a lot of uh, fiber and, and, uh, and resources. So they're taking that away. We have what's called BC timber sales, which pr- prevents uh, 20% of the harvest is, is, is through the auction market with all the government policies. They can't get their act together to get wood available because they have to meet all the new policies. So that takes away fiber supply. You've got some landscape management things going on. I mean, it's just an endless list. They're trying to change the land act, which will take away more land base from forests. And then we have wildfires. <laughs> and we're already gearing up for uh, probably the worst uh, season ever. It was a billion board feet lower in 23 versus 22. And it'll be probably up to a, a half, half a billion for sure. And maybe a billion lower uh, unless prices take off to the point that they can scrounge and pay for extra logs. But it's going to be. But we're getting close to the bottom. But I keep saying that every two or three years, we're getting close to the bottom. But I, I think maybe by 2025, 2026, we, we, there's not much downside, I don't think, left anymore. So you don't have uh, Alberta split out here on your thing, but I'm kind of curious. Production has grown in Alberta the last 10, 15 years, has it not? It's been, it's been. I, I do have the data uh, in my in my files, but it's uh, it is growing slowly. Um, they do have some some issues. They have to do with caribou as well. They're, the caribou is going to knock down their harvest, and uh, they do have some beetle issues. But they're, they seem to be uh, passing now. They don't. They've sort of managed it, and the cold weather's hit. But yeah, Alberta's been one of the only growth areas. Um, well, a little bit on Ontario now, a little bit in Quebec. But it's interesting when you look at the the data. You know, I kind of looked at the data and looked at you know like comparing say 2023 with with 2018 and there's been gains in the U.S. South. You know, we've had about three, three point three billion board feet of gains there, which you'd expect. But, but, but there's been about almost ten billion board feet of new capacity. So, 
in that time frame. So it's not not a, it's a long ways to go. You know, mm-hmm. the you know, BC's been off about 5.5 billion board feet in there, but you take all the rest of North America, so the US West, the inland, uh, Eastern Canada, Alberta, and so forth, and it's off 2.5 billion board feet. There are sort of, you know, the net reductions uh, between 2018, which is probably the last sort of normal year we had before COVID, and now it's uh, we're, we're in a much smaller position. Production has been dropping, but then consumption, when you look at the consumption data, you know, consumption has been relatively um, unchanged since 2017, you know, bouncing around a little bit. Could you want me to move a chart here? Russ, go to uh, so, so I guess when I look at it, Russ, I go, okay, so BC production is going to be down another, you know, let's just call it half a billion, half a billion board feet. You know, we're looking at Southern Pine, you know, in the mid 300s. And, you know, I think we had a, the, the Yellow Pine guru on last week, Mr. Charles Delatore. I mean, who, I mean, is good. Shout guy. out to Charles. Yeah. Shout out to Charles. Exactly. Talking about you know, fiber costs in the mid high 200s. I'm not a math genius, but I can tell you that that can't be very good. So, I mean, I guess we'd have to anticipate that as we move forward, we're going to see, you know, whether it's quiet uh, shifts coming off or like longer term curtailment of Southern Pine. So we, we yeah. may see, we may see some that COVID term, some quiet quitting and production. I'm just postulating here that I mean it would that would seem that would seem to be the case. Now they've got a lot more flexibility on log costs because so many. I mean, I'm going to say this in huge generalization, and when Charles comes back on, he can correct me. That there's a lot of wood in the South that's gate wood, which you know fluctuate week week to week in terms of what they're paying for it. You know, yes, there's long term contracts, but there's a lot of gate wood too. They don't have to build a lot. They don't have to build the same type of log deck as they do in BC Cor- in Canada. Basically, correct. correct. That's why um, that's why those mills sit on a smaller footprint. Well, the the trees grow in like seven weeks too, so yeah, it's yeah. no big deal. Um, and, and I so so I guess I'm, you know I'm on this whole thing. I'm going okay, Russ, and I think I'll ask you this question: What do you anticipate consumption to be this year versus last year? That's a good question, but uh, you know I'm I'm a little bit bullish. I mean I'm I'm hearing lots of the the housing companies talking about uh, their their sales are looking pretty good. I mean. Repair and remodeling is maybe it's got a negative undertone in general, but the, the, apparently the box stores are, are moving wood very nicely is what I'm hearing. So you have to be careful when you look at macro data versus isolating it down to what wood products are doing. I, I think that's with lower prices, that's going to certainly draw, I think, some people into the market. So I'm, I'm pretty upbeat that, that we're going to get uh, an increase in, in consumption overall compared to last year by you know perhaps 5% which is a lot better than the previous year because it was down. It was negative uh, two or three percent. You know, a five percent, a seven percent swing in one year, that's pretty good. And uh, and I think prices at some point, they're going to break through in the south. They have to, I think, or there's going to be more curtailments until they break through. But uh, the supply chain is still pretty, uh, inventories are low, I understand, in the field. No one needs to buy at these low prices. So I think the the demand is going to be a little bit stronger. And we always talk about the second half of the year, but it may be sooner. And then production is still pretty, aside from the South, there's not a lot of extra capacity in in other regions. So that tells me that there could be a bit of a a price, a couple of little minor price spikes coming just to, you know. Okay. I mean, I know some of our viewers are going to like, that's just going to be like a uh, crack for their ears because they're they're hoping for it. But I think you bring up a you bring up a really good point there, Russ, in that if your numbers are right and we have, you know, hey, okay, production is going to be lower in North America and we know that European imports are running, you know, they were down a little bit last year and they're going to be lower this year. How much lower depended on what prices are in the second half of the year, but you know, they're probably trending to be you know, down high single or, or, or low or low double digits year over year. But like for our listeners, this is what happens is the supply is going to overcorrect versus demand. And right now, it, the marketplace is giving the illusion that there's more supply than there needs to be. Why? because we're taking it out of inventories in the field, in the pipeline. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And 
you know, I've I've heard this uh, argument before about the euro euro imports are going to be lower th- this year than last year. I'll, I'll find out next week in Montreal when I talk to my European counterparts there. But but talking to them earlier, the message I got was that you know the market in Europe is weak. The log costs are a little a little bit on the high side too right now, and they they need high prices for export markets. Now, if, if you're competing with SPF um, in the North American market, prices are actually pretty good right now. And the other market, the big market they've got is the Middle East, North African market. Those are always quite volatile and unstable and and, and so forth. But, you know, if, if they're going to get into, into full production, they're going to need a market like the U.S. to go to. I don't see any reason why uh, they wouldn't come harder next year or this year or the same as last year, let's say. Because because of their market options, you know, China prices are still pretty weak as well. So uh, they're not going to be selling a lot more volume, less volume in Europe. So if they want to run their mills, they've got to export. I think uh, well, you might see some surprises uh, as these higher prices, if these higher prices stick at all uh, in the North American market, we may see them coming back, uh, certainly for a quarter at least, uh, and maybe more. We're going to look forward to um, you uh, doing that deep dive while you're up in Montreal next week, because, you know, I mean, this is something you know, trying to put your finger on on this is, you know, I mean, we get antidotal viewpoints from like from producer partners. One of the beautiful things and challenging things about European imports is that it's so highly fragmented and the information flow is less perfect than um, you know some of the information flow on, on North American markets. Russ, I like this production, lumber production, US, Canada, North America and consumption chart. Just looking at it, I didn't. So in 2005, when we were at the that peak booming housing market near 2 million starts, production was about 75 billion board feet. That makes sense, right? Yep, yep. And we went all the way down to 42 billion board feet, probably lower than that if you include 10 and 11, or is that is that the low in 2009? 2009, yeah. Okay, and then ramp back up, 2018 at 62, but we're only at 57, 515, 57 billion board feet in 23. And the consumption side of it, you were talking, I mean, consumption between 18 and 23 hasn't really moved that much. Exactly. It's hardly moved at all. Yeah. It's hey, Russ, how do they how do they come up with the consumption number? Well, it's it, the term is apparent consumption because it's a calculation between it's just production, you know, plus imports minus exports. Right, so, right, right. It, they make uh, it up, right? It's a calculation and it doesn't account <laughs> it doesn't account for inventories and you know, you know, it's a loose guide, but it's not, it's a guesstimate. not precise. Yeah. And, and if you look at the monthly data, it's it's, it's all really wonky because Sometimes it's plus 20 and minus 20 because month over month, it's inventories are changing like crazy. So it's just, but over the course of a year, it's, it gets pretty close. Yeah. So that, what it means too, is that, you know, when I look at some of the data and you, you know, like, like um, relative to North American consumption, U S production and U S and Canada production versus North American consumption, it's pretty even, you know, we have no extra volumes for net imports or net exports are pretty much zero. Whereas back in, you know, after 2009, we had surplus uh, volumes to export. So we were exporting uh, significant volumes. But since about 2019, our net exports, net imports versus exports has been kind of zero because we don't have the production to feed North American demand. So we have to reduce exports and bring in the imports, hence the European imports. And that's been what's been happening the last four or five years is, you know, steady, steady increases in the euro imports to fill that gap yeah i mean and, and it's all and it's all driven by price as you made an interesting comment about the uh european middle eastern markets because the reports that we're been getting and you know like this may not this may be like you know somebody in the sales function you know we continue to get the reports that the returns in the national markets and even the you know relative middle east are better than the U.S. returns right now. So that's, I mean, I guess that's another, that's another question mark that I have is what's really the answer there? You know, are the returns really better over there or, you know, are, is that not the case? So. Yeah. And, and the, 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 it's, it cycles back and forth. I mean, I've, I've heard the same thing, but 
but but often like a, a like say a central european mill you know a german mill they can't always direct large volumes of production to those markets because they fill up pretty quickly but if they can target the us market you know steadily one week of the month sort of thing that's how they they gain it all back uh, and yeah and and, yeah. and keep those volumes to the middle east north african markets a little, little bit leaner so the same way i mean the bc mills are pretty good at, at, at playing with china that way they would they would sort of try and keep the extra volume, push push the extra volumes to China to keep the North American market a bit tighter, but they don't have the volume anymore. But it's uh, that's part of the strategy. So I think that they I think the Europeans still need the U.S. market, and just depends on how how uh, how how well other markets perform. But I'm not expecting the uh, I think the Middle East North African markets are going to have lots of suppliers for the rest of the year, and that's going to keep prices in check. This slide I brought up. Russ, and I'm, I'm jumping in, looking at these slides in front of you. If you have one you wanted to go to, let me know. But I, I had a question about this one. This shows the top North American softwood lumber producers, ranks them, shows how much North American capacity they have. Then it breaks it down between U.S. and Canadian capacity. I think the interesting point there is the six B.C.-based companies, if I'm looking at that right, have 9 billion board feet of U.S. South production. Is that correct? That's correct. Which yeah. is forty four point five percent of the total production of U.S. Southern Pine is from is Canadian owned producers. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, of their production, their forty four point five percent is in the U.S. So, so all getting close to fifty percent. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that trend continuing? Is that is there or is, is everything been kind of? Uh, bought up so to speak yeah it's slowing down now there's not any real you know not fewer and fewer mills no no groups of mills it seems yet, yet left to buy a lot more single mills but uh you never know what can happen but uh, I, I think it's slowing down and also the the timber baskets are getting a little bit tighter you know the you know the log prices are still you know they're still the lowest prices in north america but you know that will change as, as the as as further ex, as those mills expand out. But you know, fifty dollars a cubic meter is what I use. You know, fifty dollars a ton roughly. It depends where you are. The west a bit cheaper. The the east a bit more expensive. But that's a that's a pretty cheap log uh, anywhere in North America. Right. I can tell you. But you know, right now the prices are too low. But what it, do you suppose that cubic meter price is in in BC by comparison for our viewers and listeners? Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's around eighty to a hundred. I was going to say ninety. Yeah, yeah. How so it's much almost depends. double. Yeah, and and it depends on how much open market wood you have to buy, and 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 the tendered wood has come down closer to seventy, but yeah, seventy ish. Uh, but uh, it's still on the high. The rest of it's is what kills you. So that's that's the name of the game. So Russ, you might you I like you've been over to China a few times. You brought groups over there, looked, uh, gone through, looked at different things. This is an interesting pre-2019. We talked about how much would, you know, every mill would say, hey, we just did a big export order to China. And remember that, Matt, and the board would run and everything would oh, take yeah. off. It seems since like this chart shows since 2019 in China, there's very, I mean, are we done with big ports over in China sitting with all kinds of logs and lumber and and is that going to change? Because at some point, when does that bounce back? Yeah, well, that and the chart just shows, you know, housing starts, for example, in China from, you know, 2.2 million cubic million square meters to, you know, under a thousand in 2023, and 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 probably a little bit lower in in 2024 before it bounces back. But so we did a, a forecast on on China and had a good look around and looked at the data and. The one thing that's changing that's going to change the world markets by the end of the decade, and you've heard it here first because I haven't announced this anywhere else, you're going to see, uh, well, there's a log shortage. You know, the, like China is half of the, of, the, of the global log export market. And uh, the global log exports are about 100 million cubic meters a year. And China buys, buy, they bought 50, almost 50 in 20, what, 2021. But 2023, they bought uh, 27 million cubic meters going forward there's there's no more logs left for china to buy the russian next have, have, have banned their log exports before the ukraine war uh ukraine had, had had put a log export ban on earlier australia had a ban on temporarily with china that's off but but they're gun shy going forward uh the central european beetlewood that's peaked that's coming off fast in the next three or four years those volumes are going to be you know relatively insignificant 
And the only other big supplier left to, to supply logs to China is New Zealand. And their harvest is going to drop 8 to 10 million cubic meters by 2035. And that's going to mean less logs available to China. So all of a sudden, there's a log shortage available to Chinese buyers. They don't have the log supply. And guess what? The only other option they've got, besides some domestic species, which aren't going to be a, an option, uh, is to import more lumber. And when we when we go through and and sort of you know look at the analysis, uh, you know we we look at uh, like on slide uh, 13 uh, on our 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 group, uh, we've got uh, lumber exports peaked at, at at 27 million in in 2019, and um, dropped to uh, 18 in in 2023, but to fill up the gap at a, at a very conservative demand forecast, uh, we see log exports or lumber exports uh, exceeding the peak in, in, in 2019 by is the end of the decade. Issue, so that'll really help there. drive up low grade prices then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, is there, is, and, what, Russ, is there an issue with uh, Southern pine exports to China? Isn't there something with, to do with some? Yep. Uh, logs. Yes. Logs. It's the pinewood nematode. So yeah. there's a, and so they have to either fumigate uh, or debark the logs so to get them into China. That's the problem. So and no one really wants to risk getting a, a pinewood nematode issue because they'll reject the whole boatload uh, if they do that. So right now there's zero uh, soft uh, sunnyal pine log exports to China. That is one of the possible options. I know one company was uh, trying to build a fumigation facility near Savannah to be able to use um, you know fumigate logs and get them to China, but that. That was turned down by the local municipality. So they are trying, but nothing's in the works yet that I'm aware of. So, and the thing is that China d doesn't just buy low grade, they also buy a lot of red pine and uh, high grade spruce, higher grade spruce from Europe, and Scandinavia, and, uh, and Russia. So, yeah, the Russians are going to be a big player in, in China in lumber going forward. But unless they're going to put a lot of the Chinese mills back operating, that's not going to be enough. So, I to my surprise, uh, we we see the China market coming back. It's a good. It's going to be. A, it'll take time. All these all these for, forecasts take time because the demand has to come back. But we have demand coming back, a total of twenty percent over ten years, like two percent a year, and we still come up with this answer. You know, and I don't, I don't think China demand is going to increase a, a heck of a lot, but uh, you never know. But uh, it, it is a. There's an upside in China that we never expected, and there's also an upside on uh, in the hardwood side because they're building all these pulp mills and there's going to be a shortage of wood exports or uh, wood chip exports to china and uh the domestic we think there's going to be some domestic uh, eucalyptus trees that would normally go into veneer are going to go into pulpwood which uh we've proven the economics of that but they're, they're going to be finding a finding a lot of uh the cheap fibers long gone in in china and uh, they're going to have to start paying higher prices to get more logs and or more lumber and uh, normally that's not what happens in China. So it's going to be quite the, the, the puzzle going forward. Interesting. Sounds Interesting. good for the wood producers of, of the world, honestly. You know, I mean, if you look at what you just talked about with log restrictions and then add in the, um, the new way that engineered wood products are consuming lumber, you know, yep. there's the CLT movement, prefab home movement. There's, there's just... Modern industry is figuring out ways to uh, utilize more lumber and less steel and less aluminum and less brick, which I've always believed was a good thing because you can't you can't grow steel again, right? I mean, you <laughs> you dig it out of the earth, it's gone. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can always grow another tree. It might take a hundred years, but it'll come back. And governments love building with wood, whether it's mass timber. That's part of sequestering carbon. Sure. And so governments are on the bandwagon to build more with wood instead of concrete or steel. And then you've got timberland owners saying, you know what, we can park some of these forests and, and get carbon credits out of it. Uh, maybe that's an option. We're not going to put it back into production. So that's also going to tighten up the wood supply, you know, to some degree as well. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things changing that are going to make things going to look a lot different, I think, by the end of the day. It might actually be cool to be in the lumber business someday down the road. You know, I'll be long retired. What are you talking maybe, about that? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> my, maybe my kid will actually take advantage of the, of the fact that he's got two generations of beamers in front of him that have given him a road path. We'll see. Matt, well, so that COVID proved that it was cool to be in the lumber business. Come on, man. Let's look, go. man, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm in the office, I'd be wearing a, a lumberjack shirt and I'd have a big old chaw in and I'd have my chainsaw 
I'm ready to go. Let's do it. <laughs> well, listen, these were these were some great charts and great information, Russ. And like you said, if you want to get a hold of Russ, it's Russ R U S S T A Y L O R at RussTaylorGlobal.com. And I think that's the easiest way to get a hold of you, as we said yep. at the beginning, right, Russ? Guys, you want to talk real quick, market? I also um, another plug for Russ. He's going to be in Montreal next week. So if, you, if you're listening to this and, and you have time, seek him out. Absolutely. Uh, Russ is a really nice guy. In, in our industry, he's a wealth of knowledge. And so I, my advice to people when they're young is if you want to be successful, hang out with other successful people. Well, Russ would be one of those successful people that you want to get to know. That's a great, great point. Appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Matt. So, yeah. Matt, this is perfect. You were, Matt, you were gone last week, back this yeah, week. I, I, I come back. Everybody missed me, apparently, because I, I sold a bunch of lumber on Monday, which shocked me. And then I sold a bunch more lumber yesterday. Today, I'm not very busy. But, I mean, for a two-day stretch, coming back from spring break with the skis, you know, and and, uh, and hanging out with the family, I was very, very happy with – with the liquidity I'm seeing, I, I have to assume that other people that distribute lumber or reload lumber are probably relatively, you know, not swamped with orders, but have been able to get enough orders that they're happy with how business has been going. I, I think the customers are probably happy that we have some wood to sell them, even if it costs them an extra 30, 40 bucks. They can use our inventory to wait a little bit and see if they get a better deal next week or the week after from the sawmill. So, the market's really working the way it should work right now. There's no real surprises out there. I, I like it. I, I think you know an orderly market with some predictability is, is fine. I'll take that over a, a market that shows no real pattern and and or either flat. I, I don't like flat markets for long periods of time, and I don't like crazy up down markets for long periods of time either. This market that we're in right now is relatively sane. And pretty much going according to what we predicted here, uh, if you've been listening to our, our shows all year. We were talking earlier in the week, you know, the market is in some species in an adjustment period. When I say that, I'm as you said, I was surprised right before we were queuing up this podcast. I had orders come across that I, I courtesy quoted, didn't think I'd get the business and I got Oops. it. Oops. And, uh, and, and, but with that Oops. said, I mean, truckload, bu truckload business. So as Matt says, trucks are not for schmucks. Right. I mean, I'm having, I was in the camp and I'll segue over to you, Greg, on this one. I was in the camp last week, two weeks ago that boy, we're coming off hard. And, you know, there were some items that adjusted items that had made big moves over the last six weeks on the Eastern spruce, the spruce side, but every day we're getting good orders and we're letting other people I guess, take cheaper orders. And I think, Greg, I'm going to steal this one from you. If you wanted to price just 10 bucks cheaper on some items, which isn't a lot, you could sell as much as you wanted to on some items. So what what was your feeling for the week, Greg, with, what thought so far with it being Wednesday on sales uh, and, and on, uh, on the yeah, dynamics? I can echo. The markets still have really, really good liquidity. You know, we've got a, a very stable end-use consumption moving to a time you know where seasonally end use consumption increases and as we had rust and we, and we and we listened to all this information mills aren't making more lumber at this juncture then they may be making even less you know the wild card is how much inventory have we drained from the pipeline relative to what that burn rate is at the at the, at the end consumer i did have one thing i wanted to highlight which was really like I thought it was it was interesting when I read about it and it just made me think. Danny Canahan passed away a couple of weeks ago. A lot of people may not know who Danny Canahan is, but Danny Canahan is what was was basically kind of the founder of behavioral economics. He won a Nobel Prize in 2013 for his work that basically said, "We're all lemmings looking for the next cliff." to go over. Basically what he went through is all of his stuff is that we are not rational in our decisions about investing in trading. We're not rational. We don't do what is the rational thing. Why is that? Because we're human and we have emotions and we let that get in the way of our decision making. So I just want to throw that out there at this juncture in the marketplace for some of our listeners to, you know, to think about that. Check. Do do a check on that. 
And and part of it, why it brought me up is it's one of it is uh, what's your risk profile? What's your risk profile? And you know, and and can you accurately whether you're a multifamily developer, whether you're a uh, wholesale distributor, whether you're a trust manufacturer, whether you're a, whether you're a pro yard, whether you're an industrial user, what is your inventory based on the number? Based on you know, like what is your inventory in numbers of days? And how does that stack up based on what your projection is for what your business is going to be next month and the month after? And, you know, how do you find that sweet spot that's irrespective of what you think about the market? Wow. Things that make you go, Things that make you go, huh? (laughs) You you basically just summarized how to be a responsible businessman in, in the lumber business in a commodity that goes up and down is... Really, you have to understand risk and you have to understand how much risk are you willing to take as a person. Not everybody has the same risk tolerances. It's like going to Vegas. Some people play the nickel slots, some people play play the hundred dollar hand blackjack table. You know, so your your risk tolerance is based on your own personal internal clock, I guess. But I always say stay in your lane, stay on your tracks, you know, don't when you get over your skis a little bit in lumber, whether you buy too much wood or take too much risk or take too many shorts, it can make you feel really uncomfortable and not sleep very well at night. So um, it's okay to take a little ex- extra risk here and there, but you really should understand risk, like really down to the penny, understand risk. Uh, we, we saw that in 2021 and 2022 when we had these massive rallies, and then we were followed that with massive sell-offs. And people lost their jobs over it because they never thought the price of lumber was going to go down again and they just went broke. And rather than deal with their debt that they just created for their company, they just either quit or got fired and went to work for somebody else. And I, I find that distasteful personally. I, I think what this guy's saying too, if you're buying for, for jobs that you have sold already and you want to just take the risk out of it and be rational, how have you covered everything that you need to cover? Because now if you look all these major home build or home builders. I just saw a report this week where across the United States, do you know out of the big track, the large builders now control 50% of the starts across the United States, up from like 30% 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yep. What happened also during COVID, everybody went from 90 day locks to 30 day locks, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, as these builders get bigger and have more visibility out to where they're building and they start giving this risk to these large yards which they will how are you managing that right and i think taking the motion out of that is that kind of what you were talking about too greg yeah i did want did want to have one correction uh he, he won the nobel prize in 2001 not 2013 oh okay uh, I did, you know i just didn't want to have to like you know print the print the correction on that because uh and were you reading that were you reading that off of an actual hard copy paper yeah, it was the article. The, uh, the article was in uh, the journal over the weekend. So some of our listeners may have already known about Danny Canahan, but I, th- I found it fascinating. You know, it's like they, they had they did this big study. You know, if you ask people to flip a coin and they'd had to risk a hundred dollars, how much would they have to get if they're right? They said two hundred. <laughs> right? You have a you have a fifty fifty chance, right? <laughs> So um, to say I need to double my money. So this highlights that's um, anyhow. Um, <laughs> do, do, do let's do the merry date dump thing. Yeah, Ash. yeah, yeah. We just let's went down move on. Hole. All right, let's go. Let's go, hole. Let's, we let's go into hole. our favorite segment of merry date and dump. What product you're uh, you're looking at? Who wants to go first? Uh, I actually wrote some stuff down here. Actually, I want to point something out. Gather around, children. Uncle Matt's going to talk. I want to say thanks to Greg for being such a smart person who reads a lot about economics because I always learn from him and he brings out a name like that and starts talking about it like no big deal. I think that's pretty cool, actually. As far as the way I view the market, I don't really want to marry anything right now, but if I had to pick something, I would marry hard counter Doug Fur and Spruce Nines. So like, you know, you get a mill that tees you up and says, I need to move five or 10 cars and nine footers, counter them 60 bucks, own them. Turn around, sell the September futures against it. I think that's a great trade. I would marry that. In fact, I just think September futures is something that I kind of want to marry. 
you know, she's cute. As far as dating goes, if I had to pick one thing in the West that makes the most sense to buy and speculate on right now for a short period of time, I would say two to six hem for two and better. It's undervalued compared to two before. It's relatively liquid. Doug for two to six is very liquid. And so if you can if you can uh, switch gears and switch species, the hem fur is a much cheaper option. And um, and I think I think it pay, I think it's worth paying some attention to at the moment. Then as far as punting or you know kick kick them out of the car, whatever you want to call it, dump. I I just don't want to own two before anything, honestly, dimension wise. I'm not interested in buying two before spruce. I'm not interested in buying two before hem fur. Not interested in Doug for two before green or dry. I'm just not interested in two before. I just think there's a a repricing of that that's occurring as we speak right now. And we were joking about going up to Montreal next week, a month ago, Ashley. And we were talking about how they were going to get all lathered up and you know wearing the wearing the the, the wife beater with the oiled chest hair glistening in the sun. That's not going to happen. Bro, that, I'm that visual. You're like, that, you're, you lost me on that. Brother. That is not going to happen. <laughs> they, they are going to be listening, not telling. So I'm listening. If a mill comes to me on two before something or other that makes sense tally wise, and they want to be aggressive on the price. Yeah. I'll pay, I'll pay what I used to pay a month or two ago. I'm not going to pay today's price. So in that regard, I'm just, kicking two before dimension lumber out, out the door don't care Ash? i'll i'll jump in um so i had a, a mary item similar to yours matt we were looking at the basis charts the other day and two before nines are kind of back to if you can get a good counter investment level mm-hmm. in spruce too and uh we look at that because over historically if two by four nine footers get down to what the western mill base is bc base on when it gets to zero and below that, it seems to be a pretty good buy. And print isn't showing that, but there have been some counters that I heard out there, of volume being taken pretty damn close to that. And nine footers have good liquidity. They're used everywhere. So you can always move them. We've moved a lot of trucks this week of those. I also still like to be married to MSR. I think that's a long-term marriage because you have to sit there and let that basis work. Uh, dating wise, I'm just trying to find items that I like that seem undervalued this week. I bought some two by four twelves on the port because they were well under 14s and 16s and already able to move some of those and, uh, and dump. I mean, I'm kind of on the edge of dump and date on two by four 16s because they're so fun to, to sell and buy all the time. You just can't make any, it's just a volatile, hard one to manage especially with all the stuff, the unknown unknowns of who's buying from what European mill at what price and who's doing what. That's That, that seemed to be the topic this week, Matt. What, who's the cheapest one on 2 by 4 16s? They're down the 40 today? bucks since I went on vacation. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. So that's, and that, that wasn't enough. One guy that we talked to said he needed another $15 to make him go away. I'm like, dude, come on, man. <laughs> Kick a guy when they're down. So that's, uh, that's, my, <laughs> that's my, my deal, Greg. Well, the one thing I will like just like highlight is like t- what happened to two by four fourteens kind of overnight in the over the last few weeks. They went from being you know a big discount to sixteens to actually being a premium. We've sold fourteens for more money than we can get for sixteens. But yeah, no, I've got a little di- I've got a little misdirection here. I'm like Mary, Mary, Mary. I'm not I'm not dating anything. I'm not breaking up with anything. I'm married to 1650. We're going to we're going to be talking about that for the next 60 90 days for sure. My sense is, is that we're not going to get the return out of that that we expected. We might even get chinked up a little bit, but you know, we got to let it play it play its course out. And the reason why I say that is all the species shipping switching from spruce MSR to yellow pine 2x4s because it's 100 150 dollars cheaper. That's going to we've heard and we've heard we've heard more of that in the last yeah. two weeks. So that's going to inhibit that trade. So I suspect that, you know, in late April and May, uh, like all of our two by four, two and better orders will be shipping 1650. Mary, I've went from a few weeks ago breaking up with two by four one oh fours to I'm back marrying them. Same as Ashley saying, hey, basis is there and liquidity. I mean, we sold a boatload of them, and it, 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 so I, I like it, kind of rolling the trade. 
I'm also marrying two by four, 16 foot in everything, but Euro in particular, it's come down a lot. That market's going to clear. And, you know, when you've got an item trading FOB East coast ports at a big discount to random delivered into the Midwest, that's, that's not going to be sustainable. So I'm Mary, Mary, Mary. Wow. I didn't see that one coming on the two by four sixteens. That, 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 <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I do want to just let everybody know we all are a product of what our position is in the marketplace. I, I just want to let you know I'm no I'm no exception to that. <laughs> yes, that's true. We are we're we are along the products that we that we like. No, we yeah, we practice what we preach. We practice what we preach. Right well, or listen, wrong, right or wrong, right or wrong. Yeah, uh, Ashley, before we wrap this up, I wanna Again, say thanks to Russ. I really like Russ. I think he brings a lot of um, needed information and clarity to our business. And there's nobody else really like you, Russ. So I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're our friend of the show. I will say yeah. one thing. I heard this, and this is something you might want to dig into, Russ. I heard that the log prices in the Northwest have shot up quite a bit on Doug Fur here recently, to the point where now some mills are maybe not going to keep paying the price for Doug fur logs and may, might take some, some downtime based on just the economics of the log cost. And I haven't heard that kind of talk for quite some time in the Northwest. So I don't know if you've heard any of that scuttlebutt or not, but that would definitely, if that comes true, that would definitely have an impact on the market. Yeah, I'm going to be fascinated to hear what everybody's general perception of you know, people's attitudes about what's going to happen over the next 30, 60, 90 days in the marketplace. That's a good question. So what what do you think when all these events we go to, we always want to ask certain questions and come back with some knowledge. What do we want to know coming back from Montreal? What do you expect the price to be over the next 30, 60, 90 days? I want to know what Eastern Mills think it's going to be. I want to know what our wholesale friends slash competitors think it's going to be. And I want to know what end users think, we think it's want to, going to be. And if we can get some sort of a consensus, then we'll know what to do with it. That's great. Well, listen, Russ, again, I want to echo Matt. This is a shout out to you, Matt. You, you always throw the gratitude out to people. And that's uh, that's a good, uh, good trait to have. I appreciate you being on here. And Russ, thanks for showing up today. I mean, look at a lot of that stuff, looking at the pine being down year over year. That was, that was interesting stuff. And as I went through all these other charts, people should really send you a note and get them because there's some really good information in there. And as Matt said, Russ has been doing this for a long time and he knows how to consolidate that data and make it digestible for, for us guys out there to, to, to understand it. So again, thanks, Russ. We appreciate yeah, you being pleasure. on here. Uh, yeah, so that in Montreal. Yeah, we'll see you all in Montreal. See you guys next week. Yeah, I, I, will, I won't see you guys, but I look forward to catching up when uh, when we get back in a couple of weeks. We'll have some notes to compare, won't we? Yeah. We'll be talking about dodo birds and lumber. <laughs> all right, boys. Have a great uh, have a great you rest of the week. You just called me a dodo bird. I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Lumber Word. The Lumber Word podcast is dedicated to engaging conversations about the lumber industry including trading ideas, market trends, and evaluations of overvalued and undervalued assets. We wish to emphasize that the discussions and opinions expressed in this podcast are purely for informational and entertainment purposes. They should not be considered as financial or investment advice. We encourage our listeners to make their own financial decisions, taking into account their unique circumstances and financial goals, and to seek professional financial advice if necessary.